share Easter with us and choosing to celebrate together as a church family. Whether you are here in person or joining us online, we are so excited to have you. You want to go ahead and stand up, wave at your neighbor, tell them a happy Easter, tell them how sharp everyone looks in their suits and their pretty dresses. All right, we're going to open up in prayer and prepare our hearts to celebrate Christ on this wonderful Resurrection Sunday. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you and thank you for the beautiful gift of salvation that you gave us. We thank you, Jesus, that not only did you die for us, but you rose again so that we may have eternal life with you. And we just want to take this time to prepare our hearts, God, so that we are not distracted by anything but focusing on you and the beautiful thing that you did for us on Easter weekend. In your name we pray. Amen. He is risen, amen. Because he is, we don't, we're not bound by our mistakes. You're not defined by the mistakes you make. Because he died on the cross to cover up those sins and those mistakes for you. That's really what this song is about. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like me. My story isn't over, my story's just begun. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does.
earth to lead an example for us, to die for our sins, and to raise again that we may have eternal life. We thank you, Jesus, for the sacrifice you made for us. We thank you, God, that there is nothing more powerful than the name of Jesus. And we thank you for the death of the cross and the resurrection that you did because you love us that much. And we just praise your name and thank you for that. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. If you are in children's ministry, you may meet me over here on the side, walking safely and standing on the blue lines. Thank you. Sunday to be in the house. Do you remember last year? Do you remember? I remember last year. I remember Easter in front of a video camera. I remember Easter because we pre-recorded watching it at home on Easter Sunday morning. Some of you got dressed up at last year. Some of you are in pajamas. So if you wore pajamas today, it's okay. It's the routine now. <laughs> Some of you might be watching at home still, and we can't wait for the day when we are all together again, but happy Easter. We serve a great God, amen? amen. You know, before we get into the message, can we just bow our heads just for a moment? I feel the sweetness of his presence. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for all you've done. Thank you for the mercy you showed each of us. The grace that has flooded our sinful lives. How you've changed us, made us new. That we're not the same people anymore. It's because of you, Jesus, our Savior. We just give you praise today. We thank you, God. Do you agree with that? We say amen with me? Amen. 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 We are in this series, if you're new with us, we're watching for the first time online, we're finishing up today. We've been looking at the ways of Jesus. Some of the stories that describe his life and what was important to him. Just to let you know, next week, if you want to join back up with us, we are going to start a little series in the book of Jonah. Yeah, we're going back to kids' church, because that's all you think of when you think of Jonah, is kids' church. We're going to go and look and pull some things out from Jonah's life starting next week. But in the series that we have been in, some of the things that we have looked at just to kind of catch us all up so we can finish it all together, we looked at the way of the wilderness. Remember the wilderness experience for Jesus? The Spirit of God led Jesus into that wilderness situation where he would be tempted by the devil. Tempted by the devil to leave his allegiance to God the Father. We talk about the way of the Tao. And to be great in the kingdom of God is to be a servant. To be top on his list is to be willing to bow down and wash some dirty feet. Because that's what Jesus came to do. He didn't come to be served, he came to serve. We talked about the way of the child. And Jesus reminded us in a great illustration to his disciples of what it means like to be a part of the kingdom. And you have to have faith almost like a little child to believe that anything is possible. Remember, dads, your kids on the side of the pool and you're in the pool and you say jump. When they're little, guess what they do? They jump. They don't care. They know dad's going to catch them. Faith like a child. Now, a reminder, not to be childish, to be childlike. We also looked at the way of the Spirit, reminding us we really have nothing to worry about. God is taking care of the birds. God is taking care of the flowers and of the grass. How much more does he love you and he loves me and he will take care of us? We are special to him. We looked at the way of the table. 
God wants all to be saved. Amen? God loves you right where you are. How many of you are perfect? Raise your hand. Good. You know you're not. I'm not either. He loves us right where we are, but guess what? He loves us too much to let us to stay that way, right? The Bible talks about we need to be transformed. We need to be made new. The old man needs to die. The new man needs to come to life or to turn from sin. It's the way of the table. Last week, we talked about the way of the garden, where God wants to hear your deepest prayer. And today, Easter Sunday. The way of the tomb. If you think about this past year that we've all gone through, we may have felt like, to some degree, what the disciples might have felt after the crucifixion. You know what they're doing? You know what they're doing? They are sheltering in place after the crucifixion. They're, they're hiding out. They're scared for their lives. Just a week earlier, Jesus has made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. When he comes in Jerusalem, you know what they're doing? They're laying down palm branches before him. They're saying, Hosanna. They are worshiping him. They are all excited. But a week later, he is hanging on a cross between two thieves. When Jesus breathes his last breath, it's almost like his disciples were like, a house of cards just kind of tumbled. What they thought was going to happen isn't happening. He was supposed to change things, and now he is dead. Things were up, turned upside down for them. This past year, for many of us, things have been turned upside down. There are many, not just in our country, but across the world, who still are living in a shutdown. Do you know there are churches that today is the first time, here in America, the first time that they are actually opening their doors, doors and joining together for worship today? It's been over a year for some. There are businesses. They're not sure if next month they'll be around. There's some uncertainty still. There's still some fear that is going on. Many have suffered grief. Within our church, larger family, there's been some leaders of our denomination that have passed away from the virus and those who have gotten sick. What do we do when our world is turned upside down? For the disciples, their world, they don't know what's happening in between Friday and Sunday. What do we do? best thing we do is pray. That's what Jesus taught us. Remember last week in the garden, he prayed and he prayed and he prayed and we learned that God desires our deepest emotional prayers. It's okay for us in those difficult seasons of life to say, God, will you take this cup from me? God, will you? But remember, we cannot get stuck in that phrase, we have to move on to that next phrase of nevertheless. Nevertheless, God, not my will, but yours be done. We pray when life is going crazy. You know, the book of Hebrews, there's a passage that says, All of creation will be shaken and removed, so that only unshakable things will remain. I think in this past year, I think not just us locally, but as the church at large, we've kind of found ourselves in a Hebrew 12, 27 moment where we have been shaken. Sometimes in our Western culture, we put our trust in temporary things. We put our trust in material things. And then a pandemic hits us and things start to shake, shaking off a false sense of security. Shaking off illusions of control. But you know what doesn't shake? The psalmist, I think, says it best for us. He said, some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but us, us who are followers of God, who are we going to trust in? 
We're going to trust in the name of our Lord and our God. You know, there's about 400 names given to describe God in Scripture. So, so which one can we choose we're going to trust in? How about all of them? Wonderful, mighty counselor, prince of peace, ancient of days, rock of ages. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. At Bethlehem, he is God with us. At Calvary, he is God for us. At Pentecost, he is God living inside of us. And that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you today. Amen? I think that's why Oswald Chambers wrote, No power on earth or in hell can conquer the spirit of God. Nothing. You know, thinking about our message today and Easter, there's an old song. Old song. I was little itsy bitsy. Some of you may know it. I serve the risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living. Whatever men may say, I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I meet him, he's always near. Folks, in a world where things have been shaken, and you may feel unsure, we can trust in our Savior and our God. Amen? Some 2,000 years ago, two earthquakes rocked the city of Jerusalem. About three days apart. I don't know what the Richter scale register was for it. But for us as Christians, they kind of are some of the most significant shakings in human history. The first earthquake happened at a place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. We call it Calvary. And Jesus cries out in a loud voice, and it's that same voice that said, let there be light. That same voice that said, let there be light, and today scientists believe that galaxies are still being created on the edges of the universe. It's the same voice that said to the storm at the Sea of Galilee, peace, be still. It's the same voice that for four days, this guy was dead. But that voice said, Lazarus, come forth. It's that voice that is on the cross. And it says, it is finished. It's all I believe Jesus could do to catch his breath. Because crucifixion, it always ended in asphyxiation. That's how they would die most of the time when they hung on a cross. It was painful to breathe, but he utters the words, it is finished. We know what that word, what it means for us. It's an accounting term. It's paying that last payment on a debt. You know, archaeologists have found ancient tablet receipts with these words written on it, and it means paid in full. Paid in full. Maybe, maybe work has been tough, and maybe you're hoping this stimulus check gets to your uh, checking account real quick because you've got some bills to pay. Maybe it's a mortgage, maybe it's a car payment, maybe it's some other things, and you're just kind of hoping that happens. But let me tell you, I know what is paid. I know what is taken care of for me. I know what is taken care of for you. Jesus, while on the cross, says it is finished, it is paid in Full. Full. Have you ever paid off something? You know, we're getting really close. Pray that all the details of deans and all that good stuff of the parsonage work out. It's just paperwork is fun. We're going to sell the parsonage, pay off the debt on the mortgage. You know how exciting that is to pay off debt? Think of the sin in your life. And Jesus says, guess what? I take care of it. It's all on me. You can't do anything about it anyways. So trust me and allow me to erase the debt. Jesus is on that cross. 
And it's almost like creation is grieving. It's almost like creation is, is groaning. And it has a geological effect. Scripture says that from noon until three, darkness came over the land. Almost like a supernatural shadow covers the land. And in a moment, the curtain in the temple was torn in two. From top to bottom, that curtain was that dividing wall between man and God. Only the high priest was allowed behind the curtain. And he could only go one time a year into the place called the Holy of Holies. Ephesians talks about, says that Jesus destroyed the barrier. He made a way into the Holy of Holies for each one of us as an all-access pass because of his righteousness. That's why we can pray. That's why we can approach the throne of God with boldness and confidence, Scripture teaches us. That we can find his mercy and his grace to help us in any time of need. Darkness descends. The veil is torn, top to bottom. And it says the earth shook. The rocks split and tombs broke open. The bodies, Scripture says, the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. And they ran out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went to the holy city and appeared to many people. Have you read that in Scripture? Have you just maybe kind of thought, I don't even know what I just read? Sometimes it seems unbelievable, but because of this moment, a spontaneous resurrection happened because of what Jesus was doing. Scripture even says that the centurion and those who were guarding Jesus, when they saw the earthquake, they were terrified. And they pretty much said, surely this is the Son of God. There was a shaking that happened. You know, I'm a kind of Chronicles of Narnia fan. I like the movies. Reminds me of the character Aslan. Those of you who watched the movies or read the books. Aslan represents Christ. And he offers himself as a sacrifice in the place of, of the traitor, Edmund. Now, some of them, I just want to punch Edmund. You know, if your name is Edmund, I'm sorry, but there's some moments when Edmund, Edmund just needed a good whooping and some dealing with because he was obnoxious and just snotty, and I just wanted to, mm. but anyways. The white witch in, in the story thinks the game is over. But there's an ancient prophecy that's inscribed on the stone ta table that she doesn't know anything about. I love the way that Aslan describes her short-sightedness. In the, the movie, it says her knowledge only goes back to the dawn of time. But if she could have looked a little farther back into the stillness and the darkness before time dawned, she would have read a very different story. She would have known that when a willing victim who had committed no treachery was killed in a traitor's stead and the stone table would crack and death itself would start working backwards. That's what the cross did for us with Jesus. The curse was broken. Victory over sin and death was won. Sometimes it doesn't feel like that, though, does it? In our world, in our day and time. Sometimes it doesn't feel like we have been victorious over death and fear, but let me just remind you that today that heaven is invading earth, eternity is invading time, and the kingdom is going to come down, and his will will be established. It will happen. No matter how bad you may think it is, God is still in charge. God is still on the throne, and we can go to him and know that he is our Savior and that he cares for us. The dust has kind of barely settled on the first earthquake. And they wake up to a second one. After the Sabbath at dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. There was a shaking. For the angel of the Lord came down from heaven and rolled back the 
stone. The Bible says his appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, fear not, for I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, he is risen, just as he said. What a miracle. What an amazing moment. Miracles. Don't we want miracles in our lives? You're not trying to answer that one because you know I'm here to trick you, don't you? Because the only time we really want a miracle is when we're in a bad situation. We don't want necessarily to be in the bad situation to have the miracle happen. But God has done miracle after miracle after miracle. Amen. Think of the life of Jesus. 30 years prior to him starting ministry. He was more of a carpenter. Making good tables and benches. Being God, kind of hidden. But then there's that wedding feast. And he better obey his mom. Kids, obey your mom. And he turned the molecular structure of water into wine. There's like 34 recorded miracles of Jesus in Scripture. John gives some of them, but John, in his writings, also gives some declarations about Jesus. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. He says, I am the door. I am the vine. I am the good shepherd. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he says that I'm the way maker. Jesus does that miracle at the wedding feast. But then in John 6, Jesus is surrounded by like 5,000 plus people who are hungry. They get the little boy's lunch, a few fish, a little bit of bread. Don't think that's going to work, Jesus. I, I, I've done the calculations, Jesus. That doesn't look like that will work. But when we put what we have, into the hands of Jesus, miracles happen. You know, I was pretty good in math. I, 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 I really was. Five plus two equals seven. Not with Jesus. Five plus two equals 5,000 plus remainder 12. Because he gave so much more than what the king even started with because he put what he had in his hands by faith. In John 7, Jesus walks on the water. There's no way he can He walks on the water. In John 9, Jesus encounters a man who was born blind. Now, I, I had to do a little research on this. just to, It interested me a little bit. Someone who is born blind. The visual cortex is not connected to the brain. It's not like Jesus just healed someone of astigmatism. The peace in the human body that connects the eye to the brain's not there. This man was born blind. Jesus just doesn't kind of wash off some goof from his eye. He creates the human piece so he could see again. It's not just a, oh, that's a nice, sweet little miracle. God is detailed and God is awesome and God can do anything. Then in John 11, we mentioned it just before a little bit ago, Lazarus, four days dead, never going to see the light of day again. You know, I've heard it said this way, don't put a period where God puts a comma. I don't know what you're facing. It may seem like it's the end, but if God has spoken to you, if God has laid something upon your heart, if God has reassured you, if God has said it in his word, don't put that period saying it's over. 
It just may be a comma. It may be, I don't know what it's called, but a, a dot, dot, dot. It's, it's coming down the road. Lazarus come forth, and he obeys the resurrection and the life. He made sidewalks through the sea. He made an axe head float. He made the sun stand still. He came back to life. The tomb was empty. You know, the cross is not what makes Jesus unique. A lot of people died on Roman crosses, and archaeologists believe that an estimated 1,000 people a year died this way. About three people a day. So, Jesus and the two thieves, that's kind of the standard. People died on the cross all the time. The thing that makes this unique is that Jesus predicted and fulfilled that he would come back to life. You know, Christianity is so much more than just a list of do's and don'ts, a moral code. Yes, we have the commandments. Love God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. We try to live by the, the passage of the scripture like the Sermon on the Mount, the, the rule for our life. We go the extra mile. We turn the other cheek. We pray for those who persecute us. We love our enemies. But the foundation of our faith is not a moral code. The foundation of our faith is an empty tomb. I'm not sure who said it first, but I've heard people say we are an Easter people living in a Good Friday world. We have hope, but the world may be all dark and torn up and shaken, but we have hope. We have hope. Hope that this is not all that there is. Jesus walks out of that tomb. And the word impossible is taken out of the Christian's vocabulary. It should be taken out of our vocabulary. He redefines reality for all of us. Even when it looks like all is lost with Jesus, better days are ahead. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy. That doesn't mean there won't be persecution. Guess what? Jesus said, you're going to be persecuted, but take heart. I've overcome the world. Because he walked out of the tomb. Because of the miracle that happened. We have hope. For those who are playing in Vocalist, please come. We're going, to, we're going to sing a song of worship at the end today. But let me share one final thought as they're coming. I saw a t-shirt. It said, fear eats the soul. Isn't that true? Maybe you've lived in a year of fear. Maybe this past year has been hard and anxiety and worries and fear. We know scripture says that perfect love casts out all fear. Now Jesus just doesn't like you. He loves you. He died for you. He died for me. And the result of us following after God, the result of us being committed to him over and over and over and over again in our lives is that fearlessness starts to become who we are. Because God has not given us a spirit of fear. Now, I don't know where you are on your journey today. You may be here on site. You may be watching online. Maybe your next step is, is what Romans 10 talks about. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? I just want to pray for us today. You might be home. I'm asking you to bow your heads at home today. This is what I'm asking you to do. If you say, Pastor Brian... I need Jesus. I need
need is grace. I need forgiveness. I need to be saved. If you're here on site or if you're at home, I ask you to do it at home as well. Would you lift your hand right where you are just as, as an acknowledgement of, I need to be saved. I need his grace. Anybody else? Anybody else? If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will, we will, we will be saved. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for those who have acknowledged today they need you. God, we confess, Jesus, you are the Lord. You are God's Son. We believe that not only did you die for our sins, but as we celebrate today, you overcame death. You came out of that tomb. You were raised back to life, and you are now preparing a place for us in heaven. Lord, save us. Lord, help us. God, we thank you for the grace you've shown us. Just think for a moment, right where you are, folks, of what he's brought you through, where he's brought you from. God, we thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray it in your son's name. Amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing a song together, and then we'll be dismissed. But as we sing, I just want to encourage you. If you're going through a difficult time, you need God to show up. Maybe as we're worshiping today, it's your moment to say, okay, God, I'm going to trust you. God, not my will, but yours. Maybe today you're just praying for a miracle. We believe God hears and answers prayers. Amen. Let's worship again.
going to end the service for our dinner benediction. Thank you for coming today. It's been wonderful being in the house of the Lord with you. And let's end today with, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. You are a name of